God shall arise and scatter our enemies. Psalm 68. This past week, the Lord laid this, uh, had me look at this chapter and uh, begin to rejoice and want to share with you this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the mercy of God that passeth all understanding. Now, Lord, there are people that need to hear a word of our triumphant Christ and the host of heaven that are arrayed for us against our enemies. Now, Holy Spirit, will you come upon me with sanctifying grace? Holy Spirit, nothing that's preached from this pulpit ever changes lives unless the Holy Spirit is here upon the speaker and giving us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. Holy Spirit, come with your healing, sanctifying power and God, bring faith into our hearts. Deposit new faith in the triumph of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This this is perhaps one of the most glorious promises in the book, in the whole Bible. Uh, A prophetic word for those who are seeking deliverance. The majesty, the glory, the power of God, and what He's promised to do when we are in difficult times. This is the song, by the way, that was sang by the martyrs when they were going to their uh, crosses, when they were marching into the fiery furnaces of persecution and martyrdom. This is the song that the martyrs sang. Most of them sang this very song. And uh, Paul the Apostle referred to this uh, it referred to it in, uh, concerning Christ. <clears throat> I think it's the fourth chapter of Ephesians. He's taken, ca- he's led captivity captive. And uh, this, this has been such a blessing in my life. I want to share it with you this morning. Beginning at verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let also them that hate him flee before him. Now, in every generation, God has arisen in behalf of his people. Moses, after they uh, stopped their, they were told to move on by the cloud. They gathered all of their things together and they lifted the ark to their shoulders and they started out. But before they moved, these were the very words out of Exodus. These were the words of Moses. Let God arise and scatter All of our enemies and all the great men of God can witness to the power of God, the the, our God arising in power and authority in the time of need. God always answers to the need where there's a need. God always arises. And will you hold on just a moment? Holy Spirit, will you come now with a special anointing? Will you come upon me right now? Lord, this has been two weeks of fire. Now, will you quicken my spirit? I'm not going to preach this, Holy Spirit, until I have your authority. I'm asking you now to open ears and open eyes and open my voice and open my heart. Lord, I thank you for the strength that I need right now. I need an infusion of strength. This cannot be done. Pastor Carter needs an infusion of strength. He can't go to Burundi without it. Lord, the whole staff and those who are going need an infusion of faith. And we'll not allow the enemy to come and stop. Folks, there's been an attack against this church. I can't tell you what it's about now. It's a, it's a major attack right out of hell. And you, you will see it unfold in the next week or so. It has nothing to do with anyone in this church or anything else, but it's something that they'll, this, this church is marked. It's marked by the powers of hell. The devil himself is, is trying to destroy every Christian witness in this city. The powers of hell have arrayed. The host of hell have come. I was praying about this this past week, beginning to see these forces uh, gathering against not just this church, but every church in this city and every church in this nation because the, the judgments of God and horrible things are, are coming upon this earth and upon this nation, unspeakable things. And the devil knows that his time is short. And there's a power arrayed against this church and every church that is holding 
the truth of the cost of Jesus Christ and the mercy of God in these times. And these attacks are coming against the church and coming against individuals. But my Bible said God shall arise. I think the devil is about to be educated. I believe there's an education coming. Because when these forces of hell came against the prophet Elisha, just one man, one man who prayed, one man who believed God, the servant said, what are we going to do? We are surrounded by an army. We have a host around us, horsemen and uh, infantry all around surrounded this city. And Elisha is sitting there in peace. There is nothing alarming this man because he knew that God had arisen. And that the host of heaven had surrounded and the mountains were filled with armies. And folks, that same army, this host of heaven is still surrounding not only this city, but you and me in our problem and in our trials and our difficulties. This Pastor Carter and Sister Teresa and staff and members of this congregation, I think two or 225 or more, going to Burundi and are going to be there this week. And I want you to know something that God spoke clearly in my heart. <clears throat> you see, the battle has already been won. The army and the host of the Lord have gone before. And the Lord spoke clearly to my heart that they were going to gather the spoils of the war that's already been completed. We gather the spoils. And if you go to the, I think it's the 12th verse of chapter 68, kings of armies did flee and ran. And she that carried it home, that's the church, carried it home, divided the spoils. And so what Pastor Carter is going to do and and what the church here is going to do right now is going to begin to rejoice. You you see, this is what the chapter is all about. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. He's talking about principalities and powers of darkness. He's talking about every onslaught of Satan against nations. We cannot go to any country. I could not go into uh, Paraguay, or or rather Uruguay, to Montevideo. I couldn't go unless I had been shouting a triumphant song, and I got it from Psalm 68. Because I began to see that that the strongholds of Satan are nothing but wax. That's what the Bible said. And when the presence of Christ comes, all those hills melt. They're wax. And the Lord said, it's just smoke screen. He said, and I'm going to, I'm going to drive away the smoke. Islam can't smoke, uh, stop it. That doctrine is a smoke. And the Holy Ghost, when Jesus comes on the scene, all the smoke disappears. It says it right here. As smoke is driven, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before before God. Folks, they hadn't even gotten into battle, but the Lord had already won the victory. And the Lord said, you have prayed, you have fasted. Now it's time for you to sing a triumphant song. And I want you to know something, friends. He said he rides in the heavens. There is a heavenly host surrounding New York. Folks, what God is doing right here in the city is no different than anything we see anywhere in the world. There's a moving of the Holy Spirit here. As powerful as anything I've seen anywhere, because we have that host around this city. And I couldn't go to Montevideo. I went there three years ago. And when we were checking out at the airport, the young people who were checking, security people checking our luggage, they were saying to me and to our team, why are you here? We're trying to leave this country. There, there, n- n- hardly anybody. I stood it before them and said, I love your country more than you do. There was a despair. There was hopelessness. That was three years ago. But we began to pray about that country because God had laid it on my heart. And the Lord said, you go back. Because that black cloud you talked about is the unbelief in their hearts. It's, it's all locked up. And for three years when I got there, they had been worrying and fretting. Well, what's that dark cloud? Was it the drug invasion that hit us when Pastor Dave left? Was it the massive suicide that, that is beyond anything this country had seen? And they were trying to figure it out. And instead of believing God, instead of reaching out, there was a total despair. In fact, you could feel it on the streets. But folks, 
there was something in God put in my heart of triumph that God had arisen and that this Pastor Carter talked about unity where there's unity. God commands blessing. And for the first time in the country of uh, Uruguay, pastors from all denominations gathered together and confessions began to come. One man who had held a grudge against another pastor for 18 years. And he, he stood there weeping and crying. And confessions were made. People made things right. And unity came. And with it came a, a, a patriotism, a spiritual kind of patriotism. I believe God can work here. But folks, I went down there having known that this church prayed, that a lot of prayer had gone up, even in Uruguay. And there was a triumphant prayer because there has to come a time when you pray through. I believe this is all my, you pray through and you touch God. And now you have to pave the road. He said he, he's going to come on a highway. You can find that in the scripture. I don't have time to take you there now. But praise and shouting is the road, the highway that brings the king and all of the hosts of heaven and all the glories of God. We pave the road. We make the road straight. And I'm going to tell you also in New York City, when we have come, many Christians and many churches have come to the conclusion that what the devil's doing in this city and in this country with pornography and with child molestation and, and with the uh, absolute pornographic filth in the media and MTV and, and uh, blatant in your face homosexuality, it's almost a feeling that the devil's having his way and being uncontested. But I want you to know that we have to get a hold of this, and I'm getting a hold of it. God has risen, and he's going to scatter his enemies. We're not talking about people. We're talking about principalities and powers of darkness. Now, you believe that or you don't about your own problem, your own difficulty, the onslaught of Satan. You've got to believe that God has heard your cry. There's never been a cry that comes from the heart of a seeking, repentant child of His. Not a cry that hasn't been heard. And God said He will arise like a... Uh, one definition, He's going to arise like a man strengthened by wine. And He's going to arise and He's going to scatter every enemy. Do you, do you hear this in the Spirit? I said, do you hear this in the spirit? We are not to sit around worrying about world conditions. We're not to sit around thinking the devil has the power. Folks, God opened our eyes. When Elisha saw that, his servant said, what are we going to do? It's hopeless. And many in the church believe that this is a hopeless situation. Some of you are in a condition. Some of you are in a problem. Some of you are facing what our family faced. But there's something that God did in our hearts and something God wants to do now. It's something that God wants to do for everyone who goes out in a mission field for short term or long term. I believe that we have to leave. There has to be a shout. And, and folks, when, when God begins to arise like he did at Mount Sinai, some Jewish scholars Claim, and this is uh, one of the <clears throat> rabbis who said there were at least 70,000 angels standing with Moses on Mount Sinai. Well, folks, there could have been half a million. I don't know. But there are, a, there are a host. And, folks, when that host appears, there's a manifestation of the presence of God. There is a manifestation because at Mount Sinai... The hills did shake, and the Bible said the mountain was on fire, and there was a trumpet sound. These were not spiritual things. These were not in the inner ear. These were physical manifestations, physical manifestations. And I really believe this with all my heart. The reason we can rejoice and be glad is because we've laid hold of this. The smoke shall be driven away, and the wax will melt before the fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. That's the wicked forces. And I believe this for Burundi. I believe this with all my heart. God has put this on my heart, I think, for this church to believe God 
that nations can be changed when God arises and that when we go triumphantly, I believe that everybody that's on an airplane, I believe everybody that's there, and I believe everybody here that believes in, in God rising in the time of need, needs to shout and rejoice with triumph. There has to be a triumphant rejoicing. When my son got on an airplane and went to Germany, I, I, there was something in my heart. God had already settled it. I, I said, I'm, I'm not looking at the result or anything, but I know something's happening in the spirit world. I know something's happening in my family. I know that there's a divine order, even though it looks out of order. I know there's a divine order because I believe that my God rose up and declared, this has been enough. I'm going to change things. And it's been enough in Burundi, it's been enough in Uruguay, it's been enough all over this world, and it's been enough here in New York City. I really believe, and I'm not priming a pump, I believe this with all my heart that after 20 years, I, I read this past month, Messages that were preached from this pulpit, messages that I preached here 20 years ago, that God was going to come and have, have his way. He was going to arise from this, this very uh, promise that God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate thee flee before him. And I believe it now after 20 years. And the Holy Spirit has been moving me, moving my message, at the way the Holy Spirit's been moving in my heart, a call everywhere I go for a triumphant faith. We're not going to be able to withstand what is coming, friends. You've heard it from every pastor in this pulpit. You've heard it from me. You've heard it prophetically. You've heard it in the Spirit. You have read it in the Word, and it's, it's something that... We know deep in our hearts, and the whole world seems to be understanding now. We will not be able to face this unless we have a, fi- a triumphant faith. No matter what you're going through, God, I, I know Israel failed you. I know that down the past I have failed you. But now in this particular time and in this test, and God may be speaking to some individuals specifically, in this time... I'm going to hold on. This time I'm going to trust God no matter what it looks like. I'm going to believe that God is going to scatter my enemies. I believe that that this is a smoke screen. I believe that this hill is going to melt like wax because of the presence of the Lord. I remember a prayer meeting in this church a number of years ago. In fact, just the first two or three years, we had a Friday night prayer meeting. And the young pastor walked in, and he began to tremble. And then when the singing started, he began to weep. And I just felt led to give an altar call before the preaching. And people started flocking down. This young man came, and I found out later that he said, when I walked in the door, there was a presence here. There was something happened, and I fell under conviction because I'm hooked on pornography. I'm a youth pastor. And he said, my life is full of sin. And he said, when they started the singing, the presence of God came like I've never felt. And he said, God melted my heart. And I've never forgotten that, that young man and that experience that came to me this past week. You see, that's what happens when the presence of the Lord is in our midst. When, when, when you run to Jesus and say, Lord, I may not understand the theology of it all. And I don't want to question you why. But, oh, Holy Spirit, will you come upon me this time? I want to, I want to see through one of my testings. I want to see, I want to go through this particular trial. I, I have, in the past, given up in the past I have not held on I've not been the testimony I've not been able to come through with this joy that I have believed you through it and I'm at the place now in my life and ministry where I 
literally take advantage of every hour. I take advantage of every hour. And in all my ministry, looking back, one thing I've always wanted was to know him. Through every mistake, through every trial, I always wanted to know him. I wanted his presence. I put that into the hearts of Nikki Cruz and Sonny and all of the drug addicts who are preaching now. My son's in the Lord. Gwen and I spent some time with Nikki and his wife yesterday. He preached here on Friday night. And Nikki has preached to 250 million people around the world. He was asked, how did you make it? He said, I was taught. I believe and I love Jesus. I've stayed close to him. And Nicky can tell you, I, I, I'm not a theologian, but he said, I know one thing. I love him. And there's the presence of Jesus comes upon me and sinners melt. Sinners melt. In my early years, in fact, it continued for the first two or three years while this service had been established. I so wanted to know his covenant. I so wanted to know his presence because something happens when you cling to him. Something happens when you draw near to him. He becomes the life. He becomes everything. That, that is when God arises. And when he comes and the, the power that melts and the power that drives the smoke away is the Holy Spirit revealing him in greater and greater measure. I was so hungry, I, I read every Puritan book I could get. I, I read John Wesley. I went through book after book looking for the theology of the new covenant, looking for uh, something that would draw my heart closer to the Lord and give me faith and help me to be established when hard times came. Because our, especially with what Gwen was going through, with you know, they ended up in 26 operations and five cancers and and standing by her bed so many times, uh, being told this is it. And then and Bonnie, who's here this morning with cancer, and then Debbie with cancer and all this, and said, God, you have to do something. I've got, because when I was a young man, God told me in Psalm 25, he would show me his covenant. And I wanted this presence. I wanted God to arise in me and and, and because I was thinking about God, the hills, at that time, were, were, were temptations and things of the flesh, and I wanted those things to melt away. And I studied, studied theology, and I came to the conclusion one day. I said, I can't. I put those books up, and though I use them for reference occasionally, I came to the conclusion. And folks, I'm not preaching a sermon. I'm just talking to you as a father. And I came to the conclusion that I, I could not understand the theology until... I rested in God's promise that he abides in me, that he lives in me. And when I draw nigh and I keep drawing nigh and let nothing disturb this communion with him and never back away, even when I know that I haven't prayed like I should and when I haven't fasted like I should and I have, I have not been as faithful as I wanted to be. When you draw nigh to him, when you believe in his presence, you begin to understand the theology of it. Once you live the same to, close to Christ and continue to draw nigh to him. And it comes after 50 years of preaching. I look through those shelves of sermons. Because my father taught me to keep notes. And I, I kept notes of those sermons. And I can still sit and read them and weep. But after 50 years of preaching, and as a pastor who God allowed to found this church, in 
It is knowing Christ in his fullness. We have preached theology, and we have to have the doctrine, we have to have the theology. But folks, there's something in this church that the devil despises. It's something God's been doing in your heart and our, all of our hearts, drawing us closer to the Lord. So that when we're seeking God, we're not just focused on our problems. You know, the forgiveness is not the issue now. He, he, he is so ready to forgive, so willing to forgive. But it's that drawing nigh to him that the problem is not the focus anymore. It's what Paul said after all that, all that God had taught him and everything, and that I might know him. That I might know him. That comes through suffering. It comes through affliction. But it's that drawing. And I've seen that in my son. I sit and talk to him now, and I hear things that could have never been heard. And I've seen things melt away, things such as ambition. And the direction he was going all melt away at the presence of God. And I see God rising up and bringing his life in, in order. When it's all said and done, the question that I ask you right now. How long have you known him? Is there anything now that is keeping you away? Are you willing to believe that he's the answer to everything? Do you believe now that you can reach out and touch him and, and say, God, give me this triumphant faith. Let me know and understand more about you. Now, folks, I didn't preach long. I didn't preach the message I had prepared. But I know that I've spoken his mind. He's here in a very special way. And I want to to say this this morning. I'm not just rambling. I'm I'm moving in the spirit. There's a greater manifestation of the presence of Jesus in this house than in the first year when there was such excitement in what God was doing. There's a greater measure. And that encourages my soul and heart to know more than ever that God is about to do something greater. He does not do this. He did not prepare our hearts. He did not draw us so near. He does not bring such unity. He does not bring all men of different nationalities and people of various nationalities like this church. In the the flesh and in in the natural look at things, there should be nothing but envy in this church and strife and discord in the middle of this hell. But God has done a miracle. God has done something of grace, something of peace and rest. It's an island where, of, of peace and rest and tranquility where people come in here and meet God because the presence of the Lord is here. May we value that. May you value it in your life. Draw nigh to him, he said. He'll draw nigh to you. With this, I close. I told Pastor Carter last year at my 75th birthday, And I go down frequently to 42nd Street where he called me to establish this church, laid it in my heart. And I go there and I I just sit on the stairs there now for an hour at a time and begin to thank him. And God told, I said, Lord, what do we do? Where, Where does the church go? Where do I go? And it was this simple, you draw near to me and I'll draw nigh to you. I will draw nigh to you. Now, that's the promise I want to give you, and I want the promise to take. And for those that are going to, to Burundi, <clears throat> and those of us who are here believing God to, to bless Pastor Carter and Teresa and the staff and all the workers, the medical teams, and everyone else, there should be no fear. There should be no anxiety, because 
our God has risen. And the smoke is already leaving. And God is doing wonders already. Hallelujah. Will you stand? I want you to stand and raise your hands and give God thanks now for what he's already doing in Burundi and around the world. Give him thanks now. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you. Hallelujah. I'm going to open the, these, this altar area. For those that are in the service this morning, maybe you're visiting for the first time. You have felt the presence of the Lord. You have experienced his presence because he is truly here. And those in the annex. If you came here downhearted and downcast, fearful. If you came to this meeting this morning, you're facing a battle that you can't handle on your on your own. You need the prayers and strength of this church and the pastors here. If you don't know Christ or if you've drifted away from him, whatever it is. We have never counted numbers. Never tried to make something happen in the flesh. But there are times like this morning that the Holy Spirit just tells me, and that's the reason the Holy Spirit stopped me, is that I want you to go another direction, because there are people here that need to hear what I want to speak to you. No intention of speaking the way I spoke this morning. Because God so loves you. There's, he's so concerned about you that he's ministering to you now by his Spirit. Some of you were sent here this morning. Some of you had not planned to come, but you're here. And the Lord said, I want to draw you back to my presence. Somehow you've drifted away or somehow you feel you've drifted away and you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart. You have, you're missing that. You don't have that joy. I'm not going to belabor this. I'm not going to go any further than that. But if the Holy Spirit has truly spoken to you this morning, upstairs in the balcony, you can come down the stairs on either side. And we'll invite those who are in the annex to go step forward between the screens. And everyone in the overflow rooms will pray for you and with us that the Holy Spirit will do something miraculous in your heart today. You come as these are coming and as they minister to us in music, let the Holy Spirit speak to your Holy Spirit, draw those that you were loving this morning. Draw those that you're trying to offer grace and strength. Draw those, O oh Lord, who need your touch. How we need a touch, how we need your strength. Lord, those who have drifted from you, those who have been convicted through your presence, melt their hearts. You step out as the Holy Spirit leads you. There's such a wonderful flowing of God's love in this service from the very beginning of the service and even now as we come to the <clears throat> close of the service. The Lord is speaking clearly to many of you that have come forward and maybe others in the house. He draws and he speaks. If you hear a condemning voice, that's not the Lord. If you came up here and you begin to think of the sins that you've committed, you think of the way your life has gone, and you're condemning yourself, you're in a place right now of security. You're in a place where the Lord is saying, Come now. Just trust me. Draw near into my heart. Accept my offer of peace and rest and forgiveness. He's a more, he, it's scripture, he's more willing to forgive than you are to confess. I can see some of you nodding your head. I've had pastors tell me to, uh, last week in Montevideo, been preaching for years, so it's a fir- first time, first time I've given up trying to make it work for God, trying to please God. One thing I'm so led of the Lord to say to you, 
if you're going to stand here and if you believe God with us, the first thing you have to do is forget your past. Forget everything, even what happened yesterday. God can hold and will not hold that against you if you have your heart open and repentant before the Lord. All your doubts, all your fears, how merciful he is. His grace unfolded and he drew you now. I don't know what your battle, your struggle is, but the God who answered my prayer is the same God who's going to answer your prayer. He's no respecter of persons. But he does want you to rest. And I've always believed the evidence of faith is rest. Where you just say, Lord, I turn this over to you. Will you turn it over to the Lord right now? Audience, whoever you are, wherever you're hearing me. If you didn't get anything else out of this this morning, this message, will you hear this from the Lord? If you will trust what you're going through to him now and just say, I put this in your hand. I put it in your hand. I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to trust you. But Jesus, right now, I just turn it over to you. And you do that. And then you ask the Holy Spirit to walk with you in that confidence. Will you pray this prayer with me right now? Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for not condemning me. Thank you, Jesus, for your promise that I can walk with you and that you will lead me by your Spirit. Draw me closer. Teach me how to love you and to rest in your promise. Cleanse me, Jesus. I believe your promises are true. I bring my need to you. Heal me and put my house in order because I'm going to trust you. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, And you are a father. And how you melt our hearts when you come on the scene. How you melt our hearts. How you draw us to yourself. And you say, come my child. Come daughter, come son. Because I know what's in your heart. And I know how you want me to come. I know your heart, and I know your past, but give it to me. Thank you, Jesus, for the forgiveness. Let it flow like a river. Let the blood of Christ, O everlasting fountain, flow into our hearts and sweep away and carry away all of our fears and unbelief. Lord, we will trust you. Lord, we're not looking ahead to the days with fear and anxiety. We're looking ahead that the Lord who's brought us through the past is going to take us through the future. That God will never fail. And God has arisen. He has arisen. And you're going to take away, Lord, all the powers of hell and darkness that would surround us. You're going to put a wall of fire around us, Lord, that will melt every enemy that comes near. Lord, give us a triumphant, confident faith now that that those who cry out to you, you have heard the cry and you have answered. Now, people, will you believe that God has heard you and that he answers you right now? We just thank him. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise. Can, Can you say this with me? I am forgiven. And I am loved. loved. And God is with me. me. And you're going to see me through. Just say thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.